Hello and good evening. You're very welcome to the second in our series of Rhododendron Week live talks with the National Botanic Gardens at Kilmacurra. So I'm very pleased tonight to introduce our speaker, Richard Baines. And the topic, as you can see there, is the propagation and cultivation of rhododendrons. So this is a practical element in our series. So I know there'll be some very good questions coming along down the line, and we're looking forward to um, getting around to those at the end of the talk. Um, but in the meantime, uh, Richard will speak for about 40 minutes or so. And yeah, so just to say, my name is Charlotte, by the way. I work at the National Botanic Gardens in Glasnevin. Richard Baines is a curator of Logan Botanic Gardens in Scotland. So it is a satellite garden of the main Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh. So in many ways, it's a parallel, I suppose, of our Botanic Gardens in Kilmacurra. So um, also, of course, the climate is comparable. So um, Richard will be talking, I'm sure, about the climate um, and for context when he's talking about propagation and cultivation. So um, he's been the curator at Logan Botanic Gardens since 2007. He's also a trustee of the Galloway Gardens. And prior to that, he has lots of experience. Um, he um, worked in various places during his training as well. Um, I see that he worked in the um, Longwood Gardens in America, which is interesting. And he also worked um, with uh, Kew Gardens at Wakehurst. And he's been involved with different plants, but his main um, interest tonight, of course, is rhododendrons. And um, he's a member, of course, of the Scottish Rhododendron Society and the Rhododendron Species um, uh, Association as well. Um, so he's very much involved in the world of rhododendrons. So um, basically no better person to explain to us the intricacies of propagating, cultivating a, a very wide variety of rhododendrons. And um, his most uh, recent publication is um, a plant's man's, sorry, plant explorer, a plant's man's travels in northern Vietnam. So there will be reference to some of these Vietnamese species tonight. And I know there's another, there could be more work in the pipeline on the subject of rhododendrons and Vietnam as well. So um, just to let you know as well, of course, you've already seen there, we have a chat box, as we call it there, on the side where you can introduce yourselves and say hello. And we already see we have a great variety of people from around the world, really. Um, Holland, Nova Scotia, and of course, Scotland and Ireland. And we're looking forward to hearing more from you. And you can talk away there. And Kira Travers, my colleague um, at the Botanic Gardens in Glasnevin, is there and she'll kind of um, help you along if you have any issues um, such as you know if there's any technical issue or um, if you want to get a link to some something to do with rhododendron week or the gardens and just to say if you have a particular question for Richard please enter it into the ask a question box on the bottom of your screen there and we will get around to those at the end of the talk you can also upvote the question so if you see a question that you like um, give it a vote and it'll push it up the queue so we'll start with the most um, popular question and we'll work our way through and there's a poll there as well so you can see now um Richard is interested to see um you know what you know about some of those rhododendrons so um have a go and we'll give you the answer later on and we'll tell you exactly why um this particular rhododendron is the odd one out so it's quite an interesting one and yeah again just to mention that we will hopefully hear from Seamus O'Brien at Kilmacurra the head gardener there at the end and uh, we're looking forward to that little bit of a panel discussion at the end of the talk but now, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Richard Baines with his presentation. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Charlotte, uh, for the introduction there. And we'll just get the slideshow going. That's great. Uh, so tonight I'm going to be talking about the propagation and cultivation of rhododendrons uh, across a whole genus. Uh, it's a very large genus, there's probably about 1,200 different species or thereabouts, many different subsections, each of them very different, some are epiphytic, some terrestrial, uh, a lot of them very different in their propagation requirements. So let's have a look at one or two things. So, you know, when we talk about rhododendrons, uh, many of us have... Uh, a lot of challenges in our lives and then we become and develop an interest in rhododendrons. Uh, rhododendrons, uh, a lot of them are quite difficult to grow. Many of them, for example, you see there in the top left hand side uh, are epiphytic. They won't grow in the ground, they require very good drainage. They'll often grow in the crevices of trees such as uh, rhododendron dendrocaris in Sichuan. Uh, here, you, here but on the top uh, left hand side you see them growing at Logan epiphytically on the Dixonian Antarctica logs. 
Uh, bottom left here we see uh, Rhododendron genisterianum. Uh, the challenge with this one here is uh, it comes into growth very, very early, so it's often frosted. And we've all seen in the last couple of weeks how many frosts and how severe the frosts have been. I'm pleased to say uh, I was having a look at the growth in this one yesterday, and it's okay. And Rhododendron genisterianum is, is very different to almost any other Rhododendron. And in the bottom left there, you'll see very unusual flowers on it. It has amazing bark, comes into growth very, very early. And then these has, has these very unrhododendron-like leaves. So early growth, uh, top right-hand side there, rhododendron nutili. Uh, this is one of the real gems of the genus. Uh, it has one of the largest flowers. It has amazing growth. It's a beautiful habit and a nice bark as well. Uh, Rhododendron natalii, the drawback with that is that it isn't very hardy. It's from uh, southern China and uh, northern Vietnam. Uh, but I should say that some of the recent introductions from uh, northern Vietnam have come through, certainly came through with flying colours this year. We had minus six at Logan. It's come through with flying colours and it's actually come through minus nine. Uh, so uh, it's certainly challenging, but it's certainly possible. And probably, in my opinion, Certainly to date, from my experience, probably the most challenging of all uh, rhododendrons, rhododendron crenulatum from northern Vietnam, from the fancy pan where it grows on the summit, along with other rhododendrons such as rhododendron uh, sino uh, falconeri. Uh, it doesn't like it too cold. Uh, it likes really good light. Uh, it likes it well drained, but it likes it acidic mm -hmm. and it almost grows in pure peat. Yes. Richard, I'm very, very sorry to cut across you there. Um, just to let you know that we can just see the first slide at the moment. Um, so you need to, um, you're moving through the PowerPoint, are you? Yeah, I'm just on the second slide. Okay, unfortunately it's not showing here. Okay. Um, bear with me one moment and we'll address that, no problem. Sure, do you want me to stop sharing and try again or? Um, yeah, maybe try that if that's all right with you. Thanks so much. Sorry. So, oh, it's fine. Yeah, I'll yeah. stop sharing. Uh, okay, so um, we'll go share screen and. Okay. Uh, and um, application window. Do, 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 do. Share screen. Application window. Great, we can see that better. And if you go, um, you know, to make it the full screen from yep. slide or from beginning, if you like, yeah, perfect. Um, so that should be the second slide. Um, yes, and it, could you make it full screen? It's not full screen. For yeah, it should be full screen. Okay. Uh, on, on my screen, it's certainly full screen. Okay. Uh, just a second. Sorry about this. So it's fine. Yep. Application. Okay. Just getting a message here from Lynn, who is a great uh, person with the tech. Right. Um, okay. So you need to. Uh, Need to share the other window. Um, Hold on. Oh no, it's zoomed in a bit there. Hang on. Oh. Hold on. Let me get out of there. Uh, uh, screen sharing. Do you want me to stop sharing and try again? Um. Yeah. Maybe one more time. Thank you. Okay. So above me, I'm sharing screen. Application window. And click on the PowerPoint. Now it's coming back with that rhododendron window, which we've had the problem just before. Okay. So let me cancel that. No problem. I'll, I'll minimize this and I'll put the other one on and then I'll uh, publish that. Great. Can you see anything then now? Uh, just a second, not yet. So you, you have if you have the presentation open in the background. Yeah, I've got like it open. Sort of behind this um, crowdcast. Okay. And then, 
So let me go to Crowdcast and then share screen. Yeah. Let's try that. Application window. Yep. Share. So it should be on now. Great. And if you try um, full from the beginning, I suppose. Yeah, I'll try again. Yeah. So that's me from beginning now. So that should be on slide number two. Um, it's not. Is it not? Um, it's still on the first one. I wonder why it's not moving on. Um, just bear with me one moment. Sure. I'm going to mute my mic just while I check something. And I will sure. Ask. Thanks so much. No, it's fine. Hello again, Richard. Um, Hello again. Hiya, I just checked in there with uh, Glyn. So if you um, you have it open there, if you just close it one more time. Yep. Thank you. Um, okay. Stop screen share, in other words, and have the... So um, stop sharing. Yeah. Yep. And you still have your PowerPoint open. And if you go to, um, if you start, to, if you start um, from the, yeah, if you have it open there and you come back to share screen. Share screen, hold on. Yep, no problem. And so share screen. Yep. And when you look at uh, that, hopefully you see yep. an application window and click on the PowerPoint itself. Yep. And share it. Yeah, try that. Yep, so that's. Yeah, and it says stop sharing. I think it's froze. Yeah, no, it's doing the same thing, unfortunately. Uh, do you want me to try and go out and, and come in again? Um, or let me think. Um, yes. Right, I'll, I'll try and come out and go in again. Uh, this time, minimize that. And then... Uh, da -da -da. Okay, propagation, okay, and then um, so you need to um, run the presentation from the beginning and then yep. share it. So if okay. you can from the beginning on your PowerPoint. Yep. And then come back to the Crowdcast and click on share. Screen, application window. Are you using two screens or is it one? One, sc uh, one, one screen, screen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No yeah. So, yeah, that's it up on the screen, and then it yeah. says stop, stop sharing, etc. If that's oh, it's still not doing it right. Um, yeah, so oh, yeah, well, we can see we can see the second slide, and it's it isn't full yeah. screen, but we can see it. Is it not? <sighs> yeah, do you want me to, don't, let, me, let me try from beginning. Hold on, let me just yeah, try it, see if it. Beginning. Um, so, can you see that? No. So, I think apparently you have to click from beginning before we share it. So maybe. Okay. okay. So no, it's okay. So from beginning before we share it. So how would I actually? All oh, right. Okay. I'll hold on. Stop sharing so, one more time, and then okay. we go to um, share screen on the crowdcast again. My problem is, sorry, but this is. To, um, sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Yeah. My problem is this is taking a full screen. And I have to press escape, you know, to get the actual thing, to get the actual uh, oh, yeah. icon. That's my problem. Okay, I understand that. Um, but it did, it did work okay. You know, it has worked okay every other time I've used 
you, you know, when we used it the other day, for example. Yeah, I know. Um, That's a strange. Try clicking on the second slide again. Just yep. Listen. Okay. Thanks. Uh, da -da -da -da. Wait, okay. Second slide. And it does say stop sharing. Hmm. Like we can see uh, the second slide. Um, and there's and the third the slide. Second, yeah, we can see it. It's just a little bit smaller. Yeah, I mean, if it's if it if it makes it so it's possible. I mean, I can go through it manually without, you know, putting it on the the the, the, the slideshow. Um, it's just going to be a bit smaller. That's the only thing. But it might be better than nothing. Oh, um, I see a message there. Um, form a from former viewer slide, if you click on the square in the bottom right hand corner, it expands the screen. Um, try that. Which bottom one? Right -hand corner. Uh, the very oh, oh, yep, yep, okay. Yeah, pressed it, yep. I mean, I can make it a bit bigger. That's a little bit bigger, but I've got it, you know, actually fit slide to current window which I've pressed. Yes. Um, we think. I mean, I, I can I can continue and just go through manually if you want. You know, just talking my way through it, uh, rather than a slideshow and just going through slide. But, it, but you know, some of it, the the text will be quite small. That's if the thing. I know. Um, I don't know why it's not actually working from I beginning. Know, I, I know. don't understand. I'm be sorry about that. Oh no, it's not your fault at all. No, let me try again. Let me just one more time. Okay, if we we can make the screen look bigger on our side, apparently. So okay. If you what you're doing, um, yeah, we can make the view. We can make it larger on our viewer. Okay. That's what we'll do. That's great. Yeah, that'll be good. So, if you want to proceed, I'm terribly sorry about that delay, everybody. Um. I think you know we can make the, we can make it bigger on our screen, so we can see it small, but then we can make it large. So we're we're with you anyway. We're on the right slides. That's the main thing. Excellent. Well, okay. thanks, Charlotte. Thank you so much for bearing with us, everybody. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, we'll continue. Unfortunately, the slides will be a little bit smaller, but we'll hopefully get the gist of things. So I was just mentioning there that the bottom right hand side, uh, Rhododendron crenulatum, uh, which is uh, probably the most challenging of any Rhododendron species, I think, to grow. It requires uh, full light, uh, well drained soil, plenty of moisture, 100 percent humidity when possible. Uh, so it's a real challenge, you know, like the other species which are in the rest of the slides. So tonight I'm going to talk about uh, a few different methods of propagation, uh, seed propagation, layering and cuttings. So let's have a look at seed propagation for a start. So when you're collecting seeds, uh, possibly you might be ordering your seeds up from uh, different societies such as the Rhododendron Species Foundation uh, in America, Rhododendron Camellia and Magnolia Group or the Scottish Rhododendron Society. They usually produce uh, seedless around Christmas time and have an excellent uh, list uh, where you can uh, get, uh, you can actually source the material. Unfortunately now, since the Nagoya Protocol, uh, it's not possible to get seed, which is while collected. So it has to be uh, collected. And the one thing you should always go for when you are collecting, uh, get, getting seed is to ensure that it's hand pollinated and not open pollinated because unfortunately rhododendrons are very promiscuous and unless uh, there's only one rhododendron out in your garden for example maybe rhododendron auriculatum which flowers in uh, August uh, you'll get a whole different collection of uh, different hybrids uh, so normally, as I say, the seed, if you're collecting it yourself, you normally collect it in November, December time. Choose a nice dry day, uh, store the seed, uh, collect the seed in a nice cotton bag. And then the best way to get the actual capsules to open is to put them on a tin, uh, on the lid of a tin and put them on top of a radiator. And over the course of two or three days, the capsules will open and all this lovely rhododendron seed will be available for you to put in a packet. And the best way, once you've collected it, is uh, to sieve it, uh, put the, the, get the seeds to go through the sieve, uh, and then uh, 
get your seed, put it in some nice uh, foil and store it roughly about three degrees in the fridge. So with seed, it should normally be sown uh, ideally in December. I usually, usually try and sow mine between sort of Christmas and New Year, but any time up till March, uh, as I say, store it to about three degrees. Once it's sown, it uh, greatly benefits because we have such short days in the likes of Scotland uh, from having uh, additional lighting up to 16 hours a day is very beneficial. Uh, why do you sow it so early? Well, because you're wanting to basically get a good sized plant uh, before winter so it'll come through. And this is especially important with deciduous subjects. Uh, especially likes of deciduous azaleas. If you don't get them up to a reasonable size, they'll die back and won't come through the winter. And also if you sow the seed nice and early, you can get your seedlings a reasonable size before the scattered fly starts to hatch. Uh, so avoiding scattered fly and liverworts as well. Uh, so the seed is normally sown in uh, nine centimeter pots and covered over with a plastic bag. Uh, and the bag is kept on until after germination. Uh, what compost do you use? Uh, so it, this is very much a personal thing, but if I was sowing rhododendron seed, roughly 65% peat, 25% composted bark, and 10% perlite. And you get a better mix if you put the peat through a 100 millimeter uh, sieve prior to making up the actual mixture itself. Uh, once you've actually made up your, your pot and your mixture, put a, a, an application of Merisid on, which is a very weak fertilizer, uh, ideally for ericaceous plants. No other fertilizers sh should be used at this stage. And you get your, your compost in your pot, level it off and give it a light firming. You don't firm it too heavily because else it becomes quite solid and it impedes drainage. Uh, and with rhododendron seeds, they are always sown on the surface and never covered over. Uh, so that's very important. And one of the most important things as well for seed propagation is uh, that they kept, we keep them nice and moist. Uh, if they don't, uh, uh, if the humidity reduces in any way, uh, they'll get very dry and dry up very quickly. Uh, rhododendron seeds should always ideally be sown fresh and can be kept up to about three years. And the fresh you can get it, the easier it is to germinate. And rhododendron seed, if you have fresh seed, fresh seed should germinate like mustard and cress. Ideally, sow it nice and nice and thinly and evenly. Now, a mistake that quite a few people make is that they get the seed packet and they pour it onto the hand and they put the hand uh uh, they get the seed from the hand and put it onto a surface. Uh, I, I feel quite strongly you should never, your seeds should never go in your hand. If you just get your seed packet and tap your first finger onto the seed packet and put it onto the, the, the uh, top of the pot uh, so that your seed comes out nice and evenly. And this way, if you're sowing a few seeds, your seed, which is very, very fine, won't get onto your hands and won't get mixed up. And as the seed is so small, you know, you've got to be quite careful that there's no drafts because it'll blow. It's very fine. It's almost like the spores of ferns. You don't need to sow all the seed. If you don't use all the seed, put it back, ideally in the alcan foil, and put it back to uh, back in the fridge and store it at three degrees. And if you can get one of these airtight containers, the seed will actually respire even less and your seed will last longer. Once the actual seeds are sown, again, uh, just put a very... Uh, use a very fine rose and a, a weak application of Merisid. And what the watering does, it settles the seeds and drives uh, the, seeds, the seeds into uh, intercellular spaces. Uh, once sown, the trays or pots are now labeled with a date. Three things you need. You need a, a date, a uh, collection number or an accession number and a name. That's very important. And you know, I always get into the habit of actually having a unique uh, accession number or a collection number for each particular uh, uh, species. You might, for example, be, be sowing leptocladon, rhododendron leptocladon, for example, and they might be collected at two different altitudes. And when it first flowers, maybe five years later, when you come back, you can then trace what the origin of a plant was with, through the unique accession number. So on top of each of the pots, they are now placed on top, 
of, of the, uh, so plastic bags are actually placed on top of them and then they're placed in an environment ideally of 21 degrees centigrade uh, the easiest way to uh, heat the pots is using underground heating uh, using a soil warming cable uh, and what I think is a good practice as well is to actually water the greenhouse floor twice a day uh, just to keep up the relative humidity. Uh, I'm a firm believer in old traditions uh, in that you should fill your can up the day before, leave it in the greenhouse overnight uh, to acclimatize to the ambient temperature and get tepid water. You can use a slightly lower temperature, but your germination will take a little bit longer. And here we see a picture of all the, the pots, which are all covered over uh, with plastic bags and you see the 100% relative humidity. Uh, you just got to watch when the pots, when, uh, when the plastic is covering a pot, that the pot ideally doesn't come into contact with the seeds because the seeds will stick to the polythene and will germinate on the polythene. So just to keep an eye out for that. Germination time varies according to the different species. Fortunia uh, subjection are generally the fastest. They normally take about 14 days, while some other ones like Melotum and Flunkii can often take up to a month. Generally, the older the seed, the longer it will take to germinate. Once you've sown your seed, the bag will keep it nice and humid. Uh, and if you are, if, if for whatever reason, uh, which is probably likely, you know, if the seed takes a few weeks to germinate, probably, you know, maybe three to four weeks for most of the material, uh, it's better to use boiled water. And if you are using boiled water, because it does, it will, it will uh, stop the likes of uh, mosses and liverworts, if you actually use it and water it from underneath using, using capillary uh, action and immerse the pot in a, a pot or a bucket, it's a better, much better way to water it. Labeling, as I mentioned, make sure you have the name, the collection number or the accession number and uh, the date when it is sown. Very important. And just a hint, you should always work from left to right because if for whatever reason your label rubs off, it's a lot easier to recognize a plant from the first three letters than the last three letters. Uh, if the compost uh, does dry out from below, as I mentioned, water by capillary action. And after, you know, sort of three to four weeks, you should be starting to see fairly good germination. Uh, now, at this time here, you'll find that probably once you start taking off your bags, you, you see uh, one or two very fine flies, which look uh, which appear to be a little bit like midges, which are, are uh, very disheartening uh, because they are on the surface and they lay their eggs and produce the larvae which feed on the rhododendron seedlings. Probably the easiest way to uh, keep them under control is to have uh, one of those sticky fly papers, which catches a lot of them. And my good friend, uh, Colin Crosby, told me that you can use fly spray and that's uh, very good. I haven't used it myself, but that's what he uses. Uh, chemical control is also available. And if you use, for example, once you do get eventually potting them all up, etc., Levington's introduced uh, in 1998 Intercept uh, to control uh, both scary fly and vine weevils. And you can also get nematodes as well if you want to do it more organi organically. So once the covers are removed, we start uh, doing overhead watering. And this is, should generally, should always water your seedlings first thing in the morning uh, so that they're dry by the time night comes and it's a bit cooler, else you'll get botrytis. And the thicker you sow your seeds, the more botrytis you'll get. Uh, you want to water them uh, using a weak fertilizer, roughly once a fortnight. And again, Merisid is ideal for that. The seedlings are generally pricked out once the first true leaves come along. Uh, now, this is quite a tricky process, and we'll have a look at some of these. So these were little seedlings which were pricked out, and this is probably about a month after, after they've been pricked out and growing away quite nicely. But we'll have a look at one or two pictures of those just shortly when they've been pricked out. Uh, seedlings generally pricked out if you're using trays, usually in nine by fives, uh, that's a standard uh, tray. Cellular trays are also very good as this avoids root disturbance. Uh, you can use fertilizers on most of your seedlings to encourage them, but just be aware uh, 
but Thomsonia and Taliensis, Taliensis seedlings hate any uh, 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 fertilizer applications. So you've got to, I would I'd probably avoid giving those any uh, liquid feeds. So when you first prick them out, again, just keep the, the seedlings at 17 to 21 ideally, but then you can actually reduce the temperature uh, down somewhat. So here we see some of the, the seedlings being, being uh, pricked out. Sometimes, you know, ideally the seedlings should be pricked out individually, but sometimes they're very small and it would probably do more damage. So just prick them out into clusters, a little bit like you do Lobelia, and then you can prick them out individually the following year. And again, what does it look like when they're all pricked out? Again, you can see a little bit of moss starting to form on uh, the surface there, which is very normal, uh, but little seedlings pricked out into trays. And this is the actual pricking out process, uh, individual seedlings. When you're handling the seedlings, always handle them by the leaves, never handle, handle them by the stems. And that's because if you damage the leaf, the leaf will die away and regrow again. But if you damage the stem, that's it for good. So it's quite a delicate operation. And, you know, just try and do it out of full sun and a little bit of shade. And here we see uh, newly pricked out seedlings. These maybe look like Rhododendron and Leptocladon, probably, from Vietnam. And again, just other ones. But it's just as you just prick them out as you would any other seedling. Uh, these ones here were just pricked out into clusters, as you can see, because they were so small. Uh, these were seedlings which were pricked out last year. I took this photograph this last week, and so these will be pricked out individually, probably into individual pots actually now uh, this coming week. Uh, when they're in the greenhouse, if the greenhouse, uh, if you've got a particularly uh, hot spell of weather, we always find it's better to put some nettle, nettle on, uh, just to provide additional shading. Uh, and sometimes you can provide, you know, the likes of, if you don't have any net on, some newspaper and keep it, you know, moist with the, a watering can going over it two or three times a day. Which, But they hate being in full sun. They will very, very quickly burn off. So ideally, you know, a north-facing frame or a frame inside a glass house with some net on. And once the seedlings start to grow on, uh, here we see uh, Rhododendron, probably Saxicolum, and on the right hand side, Facetum, some seedlings from last year. Uh, so, once they've actually been pricked on, uh, they grow quite quickly, some of them. Some of the azaleas and trifloras grow quite quickly. And you can actually, once they've been pricked out into trays, you can actually go ahead and prick them into seven or nine centimeter pots. Uh, but when, when you're pricking them out, it's quite a personal choice whether you actually go for a square pot, a round pot, or even an air pot. Uh, you've got a few choices there. But certainly one of the most important things is that from late September, you stop all liquid feeding because the plants need to harden up for winter. Uh, they can make, you know, a good lot of growth uh, before uh, winter, a lot of the trifloras, and sometimes you actually need to pinch them out to get nice bushy plants. Some plant, some uh, subsections, like for example, Grandia and Falconera, uh, just produce single stems and are much slower growing. Uh, Grandia and Falconera can take up to 10, 15 years to flower, that's not unusual. So some will flower a lot earlier than others. Some of your uh, you know, dwarf medinias and azaleas will uh, certainly flower after three years. Growing on a young plant, so here we see a range of young plants which are just growing on. Uh, they grow on quite quickly, and some of these certainly need pinching out. Uh, this was a, a young plant of Rhododendron uh, excellence or nuttali. I'm not actually quite sure, it might be a hybrid between them both. But that's a young plant of that one. And other young plants here of uh, some Edgeworthias in there, but young plants just being grown on. In the glass houses and in the frames, uh, this was last summer at Logan, uh, just growing on, you know, good big batches. At Logan, because we're growing plants for conservation reasons, 
it's really important that if we're growing a plant, you know, rather than growing on two or three plants, we really should be growing on, you know, 40 or 50 plants, you know, to have, you know, as much ge genetic diversity there as possible. Now that, is, you know, has challenges, you know, so uh, we've opened up quite a few new areas in the garden to enable us to plant, uh, you know, bigger numbers. And on a similar basis to what we're doing with the conifer conservation project, uh, you know, we're hoping to use one to say safe sites where we can plant, you know, for example, there at the bottom, Rhododendron Excellence, as well as the Galloway House Gardens, where we've got a memorandum of understanding. They've got loads of land. You know, we could plant, probably plant 30 or 40 of those, which is, you know, the right way, you know, to carry out a conservation project rather than twos or threes. Uh, here we see a batch of uh, Rhododendron Sinopholconeri from northern Vietnam growing on quite nicely. And just a close up. So these will be planted. We've planted out a lot of these uh, this last year. So I guess you've got to decide, you know, what kind of pot you want to use. Air pots are a bit more expensive. They come flat packed. You use this little turnkey on the left hand side there. So one of the differences between air pots and normal pots is, in my opinion, air pots produce a better root system at each of the holes a sort of nodule forms and once these plants are planted out into situ they tend to grow way better but they are more expensive so you've got to weigh it up essentially so that's a little bit about seed propagation we'll now move on to cuttings there's loads of different uh, methods of different types of cuttings uh, which you can take in different times of the year so we're going to go through the main uh, uh, seasons and times to take cuttings. Uh, I was always traditionally brought up doing rhododendron cuttings with a mist system, but you don't need a mist system at all. Just use polythene and as long as you've got soil warming cables, you can almost root anything. But you do need high humidity, that's the key. So as I say, traditionally it was always using uh, an artificial leaf and misting. Uh, but the compost is very important. Uh, some species will probably root after about three months, whereas other ones can take you know, up to about nine months to root. So for compost, uh, at Logan we use uh, medium grade peat, composted bark, uh, perlite, a little bit of slow release fertilizer. Uh, we either use seed trays or an open bench. And if you're using uh, seed trays, lattice bottoms are particularly good because they're so well drained. And the temperature is, is pretty crucial, ideally 17 to 21 degrees C. Uh, boxes of cuttings are placed on top of the, the soil warming cables. Uh, the earliest cuttings are generally taken uh, about July time, end of June, July, for deciduous azaleas. Uh, you take the cuttings from shoots which are slightly less than half ripe and growing away strongly, Always take your cuttings early in the morning, place them in poly bags so they keep the cells nice and turgid. Uh, and then they are often, what is found actually to be beneficial with uh, deciduous azaleas is if you can actually keep the cuttings in a polythene bag in 24 hours before inserting them. This seems to help their rooting uh, percentages. So we're making up the cuttings of deciduous azaleas, remove the tip, and a bit of a soft growth and then dress the heel and make a nice cutting of about six to 10 uh, centimeters. Uh, reduce some of the leaves to about a third of the size. Uh, that's quite important. And, and generally, you know, if you reduce the size, they won't wilt as much. One of the biggest uh, failures, I guess, is the plants drying out and collapsing. So the key here is to get the cells nice and turgid take your cuttings early in the morning and try and really maintain at 100% humidity. Uh, sometimes they do fail and sometimes one of the real key to successes with taking cuttings is getting the timing right. And sometimes you can have, you know, do everything right, but it's just too soft. And your cutting, you should take your cuttings just when the actual uh, base of a cutting is, is just starting to go brown. Uh, but it just comes with experience, just to getting the ideal time. And the base of a cutting should be slightly wounded 
and then treat it with a hormone routing powder, such as free for free andyl uh, butic acid. The next batch of cuttings is generally taken in midsummer. This is your main batch. Uh, things like uh, trichostomum fastigiatum, primulifolium, uh, and these are taken and inserted into modular trays. Uh, so that the timing of those is June and July. Uh, we use a slightly different compost for those. Uh, two parts of peat, one part of fine grade bark, uh, a light watering of Mirasid. Uh, you don't actually need to wound those or, or use hormone rooting powder and you don't remove the tips. And those are fairly easy to root, those ones there. Uh, cuttings of a larger species, like the larger Irrata, Medinia maculata, Pontica, uh, are taken slightly later in July. Uh, you generally, again, leave the bud in unless there's a flower bud developing. And move, remove all the leaves except four and uh, reduce those by half. We again, with these, uh, do a slight cutting on the cambium layer to induce, to induce a callus material to form. Uh, and on some species which have heavy uh, indumentum, such as Rhododendron beruvii, uh, when you're actually wounding a stem, remove the indumentum as well, just to encourage callus for tissue to form. And in late summer, taken in July, August, uh, slightly larger species, Dicroanthum, uh, are generally taken. Uh, we use the same compost as the midsummer cuttings. These are generally inserted. And then generally, these are potted in spring. And you can always tell when they're rooted, when they start to grow away again. Winter cuttings, these are taken uh, in mid-January. And recent experiments have taken, uh, have demonstrated that this is an excellent uh, time to take larger leaf species. Uh, so even some of the very large leaf ones uh, have been found to, you can actually root them. But I've been doing quite a lot of work uh, doing winter cuttings in December, January, and I've had a very high success rate. Uh, and I strongly recommend people to do, uh, to do cuttings during this winter period. Similar technique and similar compost, use hormone rooting powder, but some excellent results with very high percentage root rate, rooting rates taken during December and January. So moving on to layering, uh, layering, the key to layering is that you get very little failure, but the, the, the key to it is that you need to have access to the plant. So it has to be either in your own garden or in someone else's garden and you can go back to it. Uh, later on. There's two types of layering which I'm going to cover, simple layering or air layering. Simple layering, by far the easiest uh, method. Uh, basically, the, 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 the limiting factor with simple layering is that you need a, brag, a branch or a twig which is located close to the ground so it can be pegged down. Uh, typically, if you can get a peg or a stone set it on uh, on top of a branch after it's been wounded uh, with a knife to expose the cambium layer. Uh, basically, it should take roughly about a year. And, you know, even if it doesn't root, you haven't actually lost anything. But, you know, for a lot of rhododendrons, this is an ideal way. You wound it, you cover it in a little bit of leaf mold, and a year later, you go back, you sever the plant from the parent plant, and then I'd encourage you to probably line it out for a year and then plant it in the garden thereafter. So a lot of rhododendrons which are very upright, you know, things like rhododendron grandi, falconeri, all these different uh, plants, you can't really, it's quite difficult to do air layering a lot of the time because there are no branches uh, down near ground level. Uh, so we use a practice called air, air layering. And with air layering, we choose a spot, a uh, part of the stem uh, where you want the roots to grow. We make an upward cut with a knife, approximately a third of the way through. And we place a match inside the cut. And then you get a good ball of very moist sphagnum moss and tie it on both sides. You wrap the sphagnum moss round where you made the cut, you know, a good 10 to 15 centimeters on either side, make a good ball, wrap it on uh, both sides, uh, wrap it right, right way around with uh, plastic, tie it on both sides, just as if you were 
tying a Christmas Christmas cracker, and that should keep nice and humid, uh, and the wound can't easily heal. And again, like simple layering, it roughly takes a year to uh, produce the roots, and you get a lovely plant at the end of it. So that's the technique of uh, layering, which is another option. Growing on the plants, once you've grown on the plants, uh, most rhododendrons tend to grow better in subdued light, ideally in a north-facing frame or uh, with some netlon overhead. Uh, that's very useful. Uh, but once you know you're growing on your plants, you can lower the temperature. That's a key thing to wean your plants off. So once you've got uh, nice young plants, either of seedlings or of uh, plants which are grown for cuttings, I'm a, a great advocate in the best grown plants are ones which are lined out. And here you can see in my own garden on the left hand side, uh, I think these are probably rhododendron, uh, what are they, Aris elums or uh, Suloanensis there I think as well. Or in a frame, for example, uh, on the right hand side, there's a nice rhododendron Yonanensis at the back. So line them out and they get much better root systems than growing in pots. So a few tips. Uh, getting the right material is absolutely imperative. Always try and get it from the north facing side of a plant. Non-flowering shoots and very vigorous shoots. Timing is very important and that comes kind of comes with experience. You can look at a plant. The first ones should be green at the bottom, your, your, your softwood ones, just starting, just a the faintest sliver of brown. And then your next ones, you should start to see the lignin forming and uh, the plant uh, cutting starting to firm up. Uh, so timing is, is very important. Uh, the final uh, little tip there, always keep a record of your treatment and the timing of your cuttings. It's, it's amazing how easy it is to forget uh, when you took your cuttings. So we're going to have one or two lo a look at one or two photographs now of rhododendrons. Uh, and these are ones which we've done at Logan in recent years. Uh, so this is one of the rarest rhododendrons. This is rhododendron Kenhirie, uh, which comes from the Peshi River, uh, or which did come from the Peshi River in uh, northern Taiwan. It's now extinct in the wild. And during the audit carried out by the uh, or carried out recently in relation to the Rhododendron Consortium. Uh, it was found that the only two plants of this actually still remaining were both at Logan. So we've propagated this plant here and now have distributed it to other gardens. So, but one of the key things with this plant here, the genetic makeup of this plant is very, very limited because of these only these two plants, which are from exactly the same source. So when you're choosing which method to use, be it layering, cutting, seed, etc., if at all possible, and you're trying to conserve a plant, you want to use seed because you'll have much greater uh, genetic diversity. Uh, this is a very typical border at Logan, for any of you who have been to Logan, and it'll probably look like this in a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, if you're growing rhododendrons, try and grow rhododendrons which do well in your climate. We're very fortunate at Logan, a little bit like Kilmacurra, where we've got a very soft climate, and things like Edgewervia, Medinias all do very well. Uh, so try and do ones, try to grow ones which do well in your climate. One of those ones is uh, Rhododendron edgeworthii, which is native to Burma, Tibet, and Yunnan. It was introduced by Kingdon Ward. Uh, interestingly enough, when we were doing our collection work in uh, Vietnam, it was actually one of the new records uh, for Vietnam. Uh, and this particular plant here, uh, we had a visit by uh, Kenneth and Peter Cox down to Logan a few years back, and he recommended that the plant in your top left, uh, we'll get it named, and we've called the top one uh, Rhododendron Logan uh, Dream, and the bottom left Rhododendron Logan Surprise. But a fantastic plant, highly scented. Uh, the leaves, you know, are covered in this lovely rust colored indumentum, uh, but just a great plant all round, Rhododendron Edgeworthia. Uh, one or two other real highlights. If I had to produce a particular favorite, uh, to name a particular favorite, Rhododendron Dalhousiae Varabdotum from Arunachal Pradesh. It's often, uh, you know, epiphytic. Flowers very late, you know, they're almost, you can almost get a Rhododendron to flower every month of the year. So for example, this one here can flower anytime between June and August. Uh, it's always very leggy, unfortunately. It's a little bit like uh, uh, 
uh, Rhodogenin lindleyi, but it's got a lovely peeling bark and it never, uh, you know, fails to attract comment. I always think it's like a lilium, like a lilium longiflorum with a stripe of lipstick down the side. Yeah, Rhodogenin and serotinum, this is a, a fairly recent introduction from Vietnam. Uh, we made quite a number of collections of that. It's one of the most vigorous rhododendrons you can get. It's highly scented. Uh, it either comes in white or whitish pink, but it's a fantastic plant. And the bottom two are rhododendron madani. And rhododendron madani uh, hails from uh, Tibet, Yunnan, and Burma. Uh, it's generally terrestrial, uh, which many Medinias aren't. Uh, it's very highly scented. Uh, but it, it's, it's, you know, it's a really good plant, uh, this one here, and it has varying degrees of hardiness. And what I would say is that the smaller the leaf of the Medinia, uh, the generally the hardier it is. Uh, Rhododendron camelliflorum is quite an unusual uh, Rhododendron. It's not amazing for its flowers, but it's an interesting plant. It's uh, often... Uh, uh, epiphytic, it hails from eastern Nepal and Bhutan. It has a lovely peeling bark, which is mahogany colored. You can get it in white, pink or purple, reasonably hardy. And in the wild, you'll often see it growing in the, in the, in the, the crux of a tree. But it's a nice plant and it flowers quite late, so it's quite useful for its late flowering. Uh, Rhododendron falconeri. Uh, again, we generally tend to grow this one from seed, from Bhutan and Arunachal Pradesh, magnificent foliage. I mean, just from the plant itself, lovely indumentum on the underside, and then it gets covered in these enormous trusses of uh, whitish flowers. It's it's generally very slow from seed. Uh, I haven't mentioned grafting tonight, but it does, it's a good plant to be grafted, uh, this particular one here. But one of the real, you know, real quality big leafers. An unusual rhododendron. Uh, you'll, many of you will have heard of Varea rhododendrons. This is a pseudo Varea rhododendron, and many of these come from northern Vietnam. This is uh, rhododendron from Taiwan, actually. This is rhododendron Kawakamii, but from northern Vietnam, plants such as uh, rhododendron Emarginatum, rhododendron Sororium, uh, there's a whole host of them. Uh, an unusual thing about these rhododendrons is that we often flower in the autumn. Uh, generally epiphytic, they grow well on, for example, they grow well, for example, on uh, the bark of uh, tree ferns, uh, and generally most of them are hardy to about minus seven, minus eight. Uh, Rhododendron quai, this was labelled at Logan as Rhododendron quai. Uh, talking to Ken Cox, he actually thinks it's a hybrid between Rhododendron quai and Auriculatum, which flower at the same time. Either way, it's a great plant. It flowers in August. Again, you know, there aren't too many flowers uh, of Rhododendrons in August, so it's a great plant to have. Uh, but Rhododendron quai, you know, hails again from Burma, Yunnan, and northern Vietnam. It's very rarely seen in gardens. And it grows up to about, you know, seven meters tall. But it's a really good plant. Uh, one of the other advantages of growing plants from seed is when you grow plants from seed, you don't sometimes know what you can get. Or you get some forms which are amazing and other forms which are just mediocre. Uh, whereas with cuttings, you know exactly what you're going to get. And this was a seedling which appeared, uh, which I grew in my own garden. And on my wife's 40th birthday, I let her know that I was going to name a rhododendron after her. And it's uh, just about to flower in the garden at the moment. This is rhododendron lesbains. I'm not sure of, I think it's, there's a little bit of oreodoxin in it, uh, but it's a great plant. It's like a strawberry color. Whereas the one on the right-hand side, uh, uh, rhododendron hodgshani, uh, this particular plant here, you know, this is, uh, very, you, you can't really grow it from cuttings very easy. Uh, this is one which I sowed from seed in 1985, and I think it flowered for the first time in the year 2000. Very slow from seed. With some rhododendrons, you just need to have masses of patience. Uh, but it is worth it in the long run. And then you get a year like this year where you get, you know, frost after frost. But who knows? Hopefully next year will be a good flowering year. Uh, just to, coming towards the end now, uh, but just one or two other nice rhododendrons. You know, with all these, uh, for example, cultivars such as uh, Rhododendron Parker Smith, we obviously can't propagate those from seed. Uh, 
uh, else we'll get something quite different. Uh, Rhododendron Chrysomanicum, which is a natural hybrid hybrid between Chrysoderon and Bermanicum. Again, good from cuttings. Uh, Rhododendron Rothschildii, one of the big leafers. Again, very difficult from cuttings. Good from seed. So if you're growing it from seed, you know, self-pollinate it. And on the right hand side there, you've got Rhododendron casuensi, a very unusual one, autumn flowering, soft uh, butter uh, yellow flowers, which flowers in the autumn. Uh, it, it requires very good drainage, uh, but a, a quite an unusual plant and just use a quite good plant for the collector. Uh, so one or two others which are just flowering, uh, which have been flowering in recent weeks, Rhododendron sequingensi, uh, quite difficult to grow. Uh, some people say the best way to grow it is in a hanging basket. I grow it in a, a more as a frost-free greenhouse, uh, which is good. Uh, Rhododendron consinoides, again, another autumn flowering one, uh, often epiphytic, uh, rarely grown, but is well worthy of it and probably good for hybridizing. Uh, the bottom left, Rhododendron carnium, which is a really showy plant and should be grown a lot, lot more widely. That's, that's uh, you know, often come through minus six, minus eight, which is a good, uh, a good, really good, strong plant. And on the right hand side from Thailand, uh, Rhododendron ludwigianum, lovely plant uh, and should be grown much more widely. And just to finish off the last slide, uh, this was a Rhododendron which we saw in northern Vietnam. We think it's a new species, uh, either Agrophila or subspecies Taliensia. Uh, we've got young seedlings of it. Uh, I've just recently been sent pictures of it in flower, got bright pinky purple flowers. Uh, it'll probably take, you know, six, eight, ten years to flower. Uh, so hopefully this is the one, one of the ones in years to come. Uh, which we'll uh, name in uh, conjunction with our partners at IEBR in uh, Hanoi uh, with the work which we're doing jointly out there. But it's great to see that, you know, there are still rhododendrons to be, uh, you know, found, which are, are new to science. And again, you know, one of the methods which I've mentioned, you know, growing bees, young seedlings from seed and maintaining uh, genetic diversity. So hopefully that gives you an overview, a very brief overview rhododendron propagation opens your eyes to the different methods which are available what may work for one plant might not work for another but just wish you good luck and thanks very much for listening thank you hello again and thank you so much um, for that Richard, it was fantastic. such a practical overview and a lot of inspiration as well a lot of ideas there and so I'm um, delighted to um, have Seamus O'Brien with us and we're going to also add I think uh, Mary and Matthew um, to the screen and have a little bit of a discussion look at the questions together so um, how does this compare with um, Kilmacurra and cultivation of rhododendrons Seamus? Well um, Richard probably grows a completely well not quite a completely different uh, range I would say Richard um, we um, Traditionally, have grown a lot of the sort of the you know what you call the big house rhododendrons, the the Grandias, the Falconeras, uh, and so on. Actually, Richard, I really liked your white flowered Falconeri. Mm, yeah, um, I've seen it in the wild, and you know, Matthew showed it in his lecture yesterday. And when I first saw Fitch's plate and saw white, I thought he got that wrong. Until we trekked up um, Tonglu on the Nepalese border of Sikkim and saw the white flowered form. So I'm just wondering what's the provenance of, of your white Falconeri. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure. I Sorry, awkward yeah. question. <laughs> no, it's fine. I could certainly find out for you. Yeah, it is quite unusual to see such a pale form of it like that. Uh, but I think it is, I think now it is actually wild collected, so I can find that out for you. But yeah, it's a good point. I mean, just from the foliage point of view, it actually looks quite an aristocratic plant, actually just looking at it, you know, and for the foliage and the bark. And it's, it's, it's just a great plant all in all, but quite slow. Yeah, yeah, lovely, lovely plant. Um, Richard, I know that we're going to get loads of questions because I see actually there are questions piling up in the background. But can I kickstart questions this evening, if you don't mind? Um, so you've propagated your rhododendrons from seeds. You've got you've got um, frames of rhododendrons. How at Logan do you control vine weevil from getting into your collection? And do you find that certain uh, subsections are more prone? I find trifloras are, are really, really susceptible 
Uh, so what are you using at Logan to control to control vine weevil? Yeah, we use uh, a natural predator. I'm just trying to think what it is. Uh, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. But we, we use it as a soil drench. But what we try and do at Logan is because we've got very, very little vine weevil in the garden. Whenever we see it, we basically dispose of a plant and we've got very, very little of it and it hasn't been a problem. So we had a couple of, I think it was streptocarpus and a couple of primulas last year, which we had it on. But to date, uh, with the rhododendrons touch wood, we haven't actually had any of it, which is great. At my home here, I had a bit of a problem a few years ago and I went through everything. Everything was either black or white. Uh, and if it had vine weevil, it was tossed out. And again, I use a, a good drench and we've really got on top of it, which is great. And outside in the garden is very little. Uh, so fortunately to date, uh, Seamus, we're pretty good. So I can't really comment on which uh, particular subsections are more. Well done, you're one of the lucky ones. Well, lucky and long may it continue. <laughs> yeah, good news. Yeah, I know in the Edinburgh um, Botanic Gardens they're very um, stringent with their quarantine, and it's something that they do a lot of research on as well, which is good. Yeah, one one of the things we have done, at Logan, in recent years is for any plant coming into the garden, we've got an isolation house, and it spends you know between three and twelve months there, which is really helping us you know to try and identify you know because there are quite a number you know that golden mealybug, which is doing the rounds, is an absolute horrendous uh, beast you know so mm -hmm. if we can actually isolate it, uh, you know so much the better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, Mary has joined us as well from Kilmacara. So. Um, Seamus is the, is the head gardener in Kilmacara and Mary is the head guide. So we have two Kilmacara representatives with us, which is fantastic. Hi, Richard. Hello. Hello, Hello Seamus. Hello again. Mary. Hi there. I only saw yeah. you an hour ago. Um, Richard, I loved your talk. I absolutely adored it because there's something, I just love growing things from seed, but what I think is really important, you know, with Rhododendron Week, what we're trying to create is greater awareness of this, you know, of the genus Rhododendron. But what I loved was, you know, how you can grow so much through so many seasons. And one of my favorites is Auriculatum. And I love the time that- it Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so thank you so much for showing, you know, how long a season that Rhododendrons will go on. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, rhododendrons often get bad press. You know, people always think when they think of rhododendrons, they always think about rhododendron ponticum. That's one of 1200 or so different species. And then the other common comment you get is, oh, they always look great for two or three weeks in spring and then there's nothing left. But there's so many, you can actually get rhododendrons to flower every month of the year. You know, it's just about educating people and, you know, getting out there and doing more work to find out what's available. Exactly. Yeah, look, that yeah, unfortunately, the, um, it, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Charlotte, when you were going to say about Ponticum, I'm sure Seamus, I, you would like probably better to come in here if you want, because. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, actually, I remember on my sorry. very first ever um, expedition to China, which was 1996, um, doing an interview with Radio Kerry and anybody who knows Ireland knows that Kerry is, and, and west coast of Ireland, west coast of Scotland uh, as well, um, has major problems with rhododendron ponticum. Um, but Richard, you've just stated actually, you know, what I'm about to state is that there's 1,200 species out there. A few of them very gently self-seed, only in a garden uh, uh, situation. You know, you'll always get a few seedlings of rhododendron luteum. But the rhododendron that is, is sort of called ponticum it's actually a hybrid. It's a man-made hybrid. It should have, it, without human intervention, it would never have originated. And it, it's a cross between um, rhododendron, the true rhododendron quantum. There's a bit of rhododendron maximum in there. There's a bit of rhododendron quatibiense in, in there. And um, it's got massive hybrid vigor. It's a real rogue. And it's unfortunate that one man-made hybrid has given such a wonderful genus of well-behaved plants um, a really good name. I know that we've had a couple of inquiries about why are we celebrating rhododendrons when they're taking over the west of Ireland in Connemara. So for anybody who is concerned and anybody who's listening in here tonight, um, what we're celebrating are 
the, the species and hybrids that actually are well behaved uh, in our gardens. And there's only one man-made hybrid that has given the genus a very bad name. So it's 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 the rotten egg uh, and the rotten apple in, in the group. And it's something that was um, created in gardens. It doesn't exist in the wild. Um, so, I mean, I, I will always fly the flag for rhododendrons. They're wonderful plants and they're well-behaved plants. Exactly. So this is very well timed in that sense and that we're increasing the awareness. So it's good. To yeah. See. Yeah. Um, and yeah. just before we take questions, can I just mention as well that um, Richard, if you can see this, um, is this looking backwards, maybe? But anyway, yeah. this is this is Richard's book, Plant Explorer, um, published um, but just recently, Richard. Is that right? Um, yeah, published in December. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. December. Yeah, so this is Richard's account of his travels um, in, in Vietnam. It's a wonderful read, full of not just rhododendrons, lots of other plants, but it includes a lot of his, his, of his new discoveries um, from Vietnam. Um, and actually, Richard, it's going to be very exciting visiting Logan and seeing some of your newly discovered species. And Richard, for you raising them from seed at the moment and, and waiting for them to reach flowering stage for the very first time outside Vietnam. That, that must be very exciting for you. Yeah, it's quite it's quite amazing. I mean, you know, ourselves and there's one or two other collectors, you know, have been doing, you know, work in Vietnam. And there was, a, for example, a plant of the uh, rhododendron, or a plant that looks very similar to rhododendron triflorum uh, with yellow flowers. And is it a triflora? Oh. Is it a medinia? Uh, and there's such a lot of discussion, you know. It's, it's very, it's very exciting. All these things, you need a lot of patience, you know. The Biographia the, the philatelliensia might take eight years to flower. We've got lovely specimens, uh, you know, which are growing on at the moment. Uh, it takes quite a while publishing it, you know, getting the actual description spot on. Uh, yeah, it's a waiting game, but it's really vital work. You know, some of these species have very fragile, small populations, and if we don't uh, collect them, grow them on in ex situ uh, situations, these plants will be lost and never seen again. So the work at Kilmacurra, Logan, Glasnevin, the botanics in Edinburgh is absolutely vital. You can't conserve what you don't know is there. Exactly. It's not just horticulture, it's conservation yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, without hogging too much more of your time, Richard, because I know there's other people waiting to ask questions, can I just ask one more question? What's the most uh, horticulturally wordy and horticulturally exciting rhododendron that you've recently introduced from your travels in Vietnam? Oh, that's a difficult question, but there's probably one that I was planting some of the weekend, actually. Uh, rhododendron sulawinense. Uh, rhododendron sulawinense is uh, a fairly new introduction, uh, and it's one of these big leafers. And it sailed, we had minus uh, uh, nine here during the, the winter and it absolutely sailed it, no problem. Uh, it flowers fairly young as a plant. I've got Alan Clark introductions, which I was planting out. And I think they are something like eight years old and they flowered for the first time this year. But Rhododendron Solonensia has giant leaves, lovely big imperial-like flowers. Uh, a real regal plant, uh, a lot faster to flower than a lot of the other big leafers, uh, but rooted in so and Nancy would be my guess. Okay, and actually, I see in your book, Richard, if if, if our viewers can see this, uh, can you see that? So there's Richard with the same rhododendron on the inner cover of his book. So pretty big leaves. It is impressive, I must say. Yeah, a really nice plant, great plant to grow. And, you know, hopefully in gardens, we'll see that more and more in coming years. Fantastic. Just, just one thing, Richard, um, Logan's Dream. Logan that, Dream. Yeah, is that available in commercial horticulture? So that was originally collected by David Knott, the curator in Edinburgh, uh, uh, in a private garden. So it's not wild collected, so we can multiply it and sell it. So what we've been doing, we've been micropropagate and at the moment, I think we've got something like 2,000 young plants. Wow. Uh, so it will be available very shortly uh, because it's absolutely incredible. I mean, the color, you know, the actual calyx being pink mm. and, uh, you know, it's reasonably hardy, but just a stunning plant. So, yeah, we should have that for sale in coming years. Yeah. Logan, Logan Dream and Logan Surprise. Love that. Hopefully, hopefully Brexit doesn't make that difficult for those of us outside the UK. It, it, yeah, if, if if only, if only, yeah, Shabbos, that's what I'll say. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Thanks. Shabbos, are you going to go with the questions? 
Yeah. Yes, actually. Now, um, sure, I am going to look back. Yes, yeah, so we've got a question from Jared. And what is the best time for air layering? Uh, if I was air layering, I'd probably air layer during September. Uh, you know, it's in the autumn and it's got all winter and the following growing season. So you normally air layer in the autumn. So September is probably the best month for you to do it. Fantastic. I see um, another question here as well, Richard. You talked about um, January and uh, January um, cuttings for, for some of the larger species. So how long would it take to root some of those, those some of those uh, those species? And what would those species be? Yeah, so some of the larger species, you know, can take anything up to six, eight, nine months to root, you know, sometimes. Uh, but they've actually found on, on some of the species, like even, for example, you know, things like Rex, uh, I'm just trying to think of any other big leafers, Rothschild, the eye of, uh, but you can actually, root. they're very, very difficult. But in general terms, you know, anything with a sort of fairly large leaf, you know, anything like uh, uh, Serotinum, you know, any, any of those quite big leaves, uh, Galactinum, they respond very well to, uh, to cuttings in uh December, January time. So if in doubt, the really difficult ones, I, I mean, you know, things, you know, like Falconer, are almost impossible. I mean, you can sometimes get roots on them, but mm. the really difficult ones, you know, certainly December, January time, it's worth giving, giving them a go. Certainly we did some uh, this last year and they do take a long time, but you'll get quite good results. Great, great. Um, so, so Richard also as well, um, you know, if somebody wants to say, take for example, your, um, your white flowered falcon right and you want to get that lovely white flowered form or if you've got a very good yellow form we'll say of macabianum and you want to um sort of self-pollinate that 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 plant so that the seed is absolutely true could you just tell us a little bit if you were at logan how how you would do that yep so what i would do i'd probably use a cotton bud and wait till probably the day before the flower opens so that there's no promiscu promiscuity going about uh, get your cotton cotton bud and carefully get the pollen from one op one unopened flower and transfer it to another unopened flower and then thereafter you can just from the the, the, the plant uh, which you've transferred the pollen to remove the petals and just cover it with a bag so it doesn't receive any other uh, pollen from any other plant to emasculate the plant. Uh, so the bag should be something sort of cotton and then just tie up a little bit of thread and then eventually your seed will form uh, which will be true, absolutely true to type. Great, great. Which is important if you've got, you know, um, superior forms, you know, because very often if you look at something like Rhododendron macabianum, you can get very, very, very good primrose yellows, and then you can get some absolutely mundane uh, forms. So that that would be uh, important. Do you do grafting, Richard? We we don't do grafting. We're probably going to do grafting in years to come, but at the moment we don't. It's, it's such a specialised thing. Uh, yeah. You know, using hot pipes and various things, and uh, you know, you, you need a lot of rootstocks, etc. So we haven't done grafting yet. But, you know, certainly in years to come, we would like to do that, yeah. You know, it ties in, you know, if you're going to conserve a species, you need a decent amount of them. Two or three, you know, isn't really enough. If we're really serious, you know, like we've done with a conifer conservation project, you know, botanic gardens need to up their numbers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Just one other interesting thing in there, both, I suppose, for Richard and um, Seamus. You know, some people are, you know, they may have old specimens in their home gardens and about cutting them back. What recommendations would you have? OK, well, I'll give one tip and Richard, if you want to follow in then after me, there is a, a sort of a rule of thumb that if you're looking at rhododendrons, um, if they're smooth bark species, so say something like bar bottom, um, you just do formative pruning. You, you cannot uh, you cannot hard prune something like rhododendron barbatum because there are no dormant buds hidden beneath a sort of a bark layer. Whereas if you look at something that has a very flaky bark, and you know, a classic example, if you take our rhododendron Alta Clarence on the Broadwalk, um, two years after we bought the estate, rather that, that Glass Nevin, you know, took it over as, as a satellite garden, we had a really bad luck that a hurricane ran through the garden. So we had uh, Victorian rhododendrons tore down to ground level, but 
Um, with these sort of um, flaky barked uh, species and hybrids, they very often have dormant buds underneath there. So you actually can prune them quite hard. And for some species, actually, it improves them. And I know that Charles Williams at, at, at Carhaze in Cornwall, he'll tell you it actually uh, uh, prolongs the longevity of, of those plants as well. Um, so in general, the rule of thumb is it that it's got a very smooth bark. It's just formative pruning. But if it's got a sort of a, a flaky bark, actually, you can do some very harsh pruning on it as well. But at that, take it back a stem at a time. Don't just whack the whole thing back at once, you know, do, do it gradually. Richard, what's, what's your take? On yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, continue yeah. on. Continuing on from there, I would say any of the large leaf species, you know, avoid them with a barge pole, any of your Falconera, Grandia uh, subsections, avoid those. Any of the hardy hybrids, you know, whether there's <coughs> 5, 10, 15 feet tall, any hardy hybrids will generally come, you know, and respond well to, to pruning. Uh, yeah, so so if, if you know it's a species, got a big leaf, avoid pruning it. Mm -hmm. If it's a hardy hybrid, you know, pretty vigorous, you know, you can go down, chop, chop it down, as uh, quite as a shimmer says, it'll probably, you'll get a much better plant, much bushier plant, you know, uh, and, you know, don't be frightened to chop it up, but chop it up one, one branch at a time, you know, and uh, just Take your time and know what you're pruning. If it could, because if you do prune these big grandias or falconerize, you don't get a second chance. Yeah, and with the azaleas as well, are, you know, recommendations there because there is a question in somebody has an old specimen, I think 20 years old of an azalea. So by cutting that back, I think it's one of the last towards the end there, Seamus. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, can you cut back azaleas? Mine is over 20 years and getting too big where I have it in the garden. So there's doesn't we don't say what a type or what it is. So azaleas then is, you know, what what do you recommend there? Well, many of the, the deciduous azaleas, you know, things like rhododendron and lutium and that, you know, will respond. You can more or less cut them down to ground level and they'll shoot away. Uh, I don't actually, ha actually have experience of a lot of the sort of American species, but uh, quite a few of them are pretty vigorous. And I think we'll probably respond in the same way as lutium does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, especially the Ghent and the Eggsbury hybrids. I know that... Um, uh, at Ansgrove, which which is an OPW property, which we're restoring at the moment, so the staff there gave um, the uh, these were uh, deciduous azaleas planted in the in the 30s and 40s by Richard Grove Ansley, and they were cut back uh, uh, by a fair whack, given a nice mulch underneath just to kind of feed them, and they responded very very well to it, really well to it. Um, it, it does help. Okay. There there was also something um i think you might have mentioned to me recently Seamus, about growing in coir um you know somebody is asking about good alternatives for peat um was there some grower who was growing on coir you see oi or yes yeah um i know that a, a lot of um or some growers, it's funny if you look at some commercial growers, um, they prefer to grow in field lined nurseries. So I know the poxes at Glen Dyke will prefer to, to grow uh, in soil. Um, uh, I know that David Millay down in Farnham in Surrey, he will use peat alternatives uh, as yeah, well. Yeah. yeah, so everybody has a, a different take. I think Chris Loder is using a, a, a sort of a mix, and it depends from species to species. Um, mm -hmm. I know we should be phasing out peat, but it is unfortunate that the best growing medium for rhododendrons is peat. And really the, for, for seed raising, actually, um, it's very difficult to find something that you can that you better uh, for, for germinating uh, rhododendrons on. But of course, we do need to be looking at, at peat alternatives. Yeah, okay. one, of, one of the things we're actually looking at at Logan at the moment is obviously we've had a, a cold winter and every time we get a cold winter our Blechnum chilense gets absolutely killed off and we've got to cut it all down to ground level. So we're looking at composting all the, the old fronds and it makes a beautiful leaf mould and okay. probably in years to come we'll actually use that, you know, which is much more sustainable. A bit like they would have used Osmunda in, in Victorian yeah. times. Okay, okay, okay.
Um, Richard, just another question I'm looking at here. So we've seen um, the um, process of propagation of rhododendrons at Logan, but as we know, um, within the Royal Botanic Gardens of Scotland, there's the Inverleaf site, there's uh, Dyke, there's Benmore. So how do the, um, the three other sites that make up the, the National Botanic Gardens of Scotland, um, how are they propagating their rhododendrons and what's the different focus of rhododendrons on each of the, of the sites that make up the Royal Botanic Gardens of, of Edinburgh? Excellent question, Shavas. So uh, one garden, with one institution with four different gardens and one collection. So Edinburgh is the main garden uh, and that focuses on the rare rhododendrons which are indoors and probably the biggest uh, collection of general outdoor uh, uh, rhododendrons. Then we have Doik, which is located in Peebles, uh, just near Peebles, which is it has a very cold, almost continental climate, quite dry. And here you'll find lots of the hardier species, uh, things like rhododendron oreodoxa. And then on the west coast, you've got Ben Moore, which is incredibly wet. Uh, and here you see lots of the, the, the very sort of moisture loving plants, you know, from, uh, you know, from general China. This is probably one of our biggest collections as well. Uh, loads of, of different species here, but all requiring uh, lots of moisture, but not the most tender ones. The most tender ones are grown down at Logan because of its uh, particularly mild climate. Down at Logan, we generally get down to about minus two, minus three. This year we've had minus six, which is particularly cold, but all mm. the rhododendrons are okay. Each of the gardens has particular uh, uh, subsections which it con concentrates on. So for example, Logan's would be Edgeworthia, Medinia, Pseudovereas, uh, so we're working to the strengths of each individual garden and which plants do particularly well. So although we've got four gardens, it's one collection. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny, what I find most impressive about all the four gardens is that when you walk through, there's the labels, but you can see that there are original George Forrest, Joseph Rock, Frank Higgin Ward, uh, you know, all of the original collectors that like Edinburgh, probably of all the gardens around the world, has done the most to preserve the collections of, of the early uh, plant collectors that were based out in Burma and based out in China. You know, it really is very impressive, mm -hmm. the conservation work that, that Edinburgh does. Yeah, it is fantastic, you know, and some of the plants, you know, which come to Logan are direct descendants, you know, of, of George Forrest collections, you know, there could be recent cuttings, you know, for example, uh, from the Edinburgh collection, which have been transferred to Logan. Uh, and there's just such history there, you know, and the, the conditions which some of these famous plant collectors endured, you know, were leeches and almost yeah. taken, you know, almost potentially murdered and falling into traps and uh, eating bee larvae. Seamus will know firsthand all about this, but we owe a lot, you know, of gratitude to these individual collectors uh, you know for the work which they did and the pain you know and the actual uh, you know the, the fantastic notes which we kept which we still have today uh, you know so there's a lot of history you know there's much more to it than the actual plant the label is just a wealth of information it's like opening a book but actually Richard isn't it fantastic that they left something behind that you can walk into the hills and mountains of northern Vietnam and, and discover new species of rhododendrons there in the 21st century and have the excitement of, of watching these plants grow in Edinburgh and and and, uh, and Logan and uh, hopefully seeing them flower over the next couple of years. It is great that they, the great plant hunters didn't get everywhere, that they left some corners of the world to, to us in the 21st century. Yeah, it, it is. And I remember the first time I mentioned about going to uh, northern Vietnam, the individual who I told it to, who I, I told I said, I want to go to northern Vietnam to collect plants for Logan. And it looked to me almost as if I had horns on my head. Why do you want to go to northern Vietnam? And then, then the penny dropped because of it being very mountainous and a similar climate to Logan. But, you know, one of the real things about, you know, modern day plant exploration is about collecting plants. But why are we collecting these plants? We're collecting them um, not to make money, but to preserve the longevity, work with our host country to preserve their, their, their flora for future generations, you know, to save it and to do our bit. You know, we often have the expertise, we've got the, the money in the West, but let's work with partners, you know, all around the globe and do our bit. And hopefully, you know, for example, some of these plants which are disappearing, like for example, rhododendron kinheriae, who knows in the future, there may be opportunities like we've done with some of our plants to repatriate that you know again with the host country so there's a great lot of work we can do 
but you know hopefully let, let's do something which future generations can thank us for great great and, and richard my last question um to you is um isn't it true that the um founder of logan was one of the founding members of the um of the rhododendron society which as we say morphed into the rhododendron familia magnolia group yeah i think kenneth mcdool was one of the founding members him and i think the chap uh, another garden quite close by uh, over at monreef i think was one of them oh and, sir uh, herbert maxwell sir herbert maxwell yeah and castle kennedy just down the other the other direction you know and cahays so we've got a lot you know a lot of history and a lot you know to thank these uh, people who had the foresight you know, just to, to see their potential you know yeah what yeah doing. Mm. And, and 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 the legacy they've left behind because i know that one of our viewers this evening is avril milligan one of the the former head gardeners of row allen in county down and here in ireland the founding members as you'll see from the the video that mark Rubin and Wendelin morrison um created i think it's went up on our website today mary is that right yeah um yeah so that included people here in ireland like um sir frederick moore at glass nevin um hugh armitage moore at, at row allen um so John Ross of Bladensburg, who was uh, chief of the Dublin Metropolitan Police, uh, you know, these were the sort of characters along with Ken MacDool at, at, at Logan mm -hmm. that formed, actually what has to be said, it was a very, very, very exclusive uh, club of sort of um, social, socially equal, very wealthy people. But at the same time, look at the legacy that, 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 that they've left behind. Yeah, Charlotte, I think you have it up on other social media sites as well, don't yeah, you? Yeah, it's on our YouTube channel. So Kira has shared a link there in the chat for anyone who's looking for it to our YouTube channel. So it has all the videos and it will have this video as well when this is when this talk is complete as well. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, and for anybody who, who's not a member, um, Richard, I know that you're a member and, uh, and Mary as well. Um, the uh, Royal Horticultural Society, they do have various different sort of semi-autonomous groups and uh, sort of the, the one that we're very keen on and that we're all members of is the Rhododendron Camellia Magnolia group which uh, promotes all the three genera um, and of course what we're doing from Kilmacurra uh, this year is promoting uh, rhododendrons which is going to become an, an annual event from here and we're really pleased to have um, our keynote external, our very first keynote external speaker um, is Richard because uh, Richard, I know you're a good few years now, but you sprang automatically to mind as our external speaker um, because uh, you're probably one of the most hands-on curator I know. Uh, very, very often a curator comes out with a shirt and tie. I normally meet you at Logan with a wheelbarrow and a, and a, and a fork in hand. So, um, and old, old habits die oh, hard. Exactly. But it really is good to have uh, uh, someone like you is just so hands-on in the garden telling us your experience of, of raising uh, rhododendrons uh, from seed. Yeah, and can I just say, Richard, just the way you described the gardens in Scotland, you know, when we get out of COVID, it will be a real go-to place, I think, now for a lot of us to see those gardens. So thank you. My pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Love thank you again. And just to say, there is a poll, and I've been looking forward to delving mm. in there. Uh, so... Richard came up with quite a devious question. Um, so we might take a look at that now and see the results. Right. Um, yeah. So the question was, which rhododendron is the odd one out? So, um, you know, we'll tell you which one and then maybe we, you can say if you know why in the comments, perhaps. So rhododendron edgeworthii, which got the most votes actually. Rhododendron sino grande, rhododendron scopolorum, <laughs> sorry. Uh, rhododendron serotinum or rhododendron penulatum. So Richard, would you like to announce? Yep. And the answer is rhododendron crenulatum, which is a true nonconformist. Out of a 1,200 different species, it's the only species which doesn't have an entire leaf margin. It's got a crenulate leaf margin and hence the name crenulatum. Sorry for it being so challenging and difficult. Well, actually, Richard, had anybody read this great book, <laughs> they would they would have answered it, that question automatically. A few votes. I got three votes, so three people uh, knew that, which is great. And now we all know. Excellent. <laughs> to look out for now. So um, we should probably wrap up, but there is one more question that came in, and I feel maybe it's worth putting to you. Um, so it's another very practical one. What causes fully rooted cuttings to then suffer from fatal stem rot? Is there a fungicide to stop this happening? 
Hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's not something which happens very commonly. Mm. I would say that it's probably caused by excess water and excess waterlogging, probably a reflection of a type of compost which is used. If you can probably use it, probably a, 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 a better drained compost and maybe work some uh, perlite into it, that would certainly help. Uh, water your plants in the morning rather than at night time and probably put on extra ventilation. All these things will help. I'm, I'm not sure if there are any particular uh, fungicides which are available. It's certainly not a common, it shouldn't be a common thing unless, uh, have you heard of it before, Seamus? It's not something I've... No, I, I haven't come across that before, Richard. Yeah, I don't think it's commonly come across it occasionally, but increasing, you know, ventilation, a little bit of perlite, additional perlite in the. Mm. Yeah, good advice rather than going straight to the fungicide for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We tend we're we're more raising rhododendrons here from seed than we are from cuttings. So, mm -hmm. um, sort of working with species. So, um, Mary, before we sort of uh, say our sort of uh, formal thank you to. Um, to Richard, do you want to talk about uh, the remainder of Rhododendron Week and what's happening? Yes, um, tomorrow, Seamus, we have a very special talk featuring Seamus. No, I wasn't plugging myself, but <laughs> no, <you weren't. laughs> there was more than me. <laughs> yeah, and as you say, we have the wonderful video story up today about the history of the RHS Rhododendron Community Magnolia Group. and. So we have something very special coming on Saturday, which is a video story on, I suppose we call it basic taxonomy, but it is absent. I was lucky enough to see it first, Seamus. I was there when you were filming it and it is, is, it is so, so good. So I really can't but recommend that. And then that's on Saturday. So that's a video story that will be released hopefully after 12 noon onto the YouTube channel. Charlotte as well and Facebook and everything but then wrapping up on Sunday is another video story and you were I think what you were saying Richard you know with regard to conservation um Seamus and Matthew will be talking about that and I, I it's great that you've kind of brought that to the fore tonight so that will be um our last wrap up we can call it for rhododendron week this year and I suppose we'll be just looking to the future for further rhododendron weeks. Right. And um, Seamus, sorry, you were, I loved, you know, as I say, out of COVID and everything and Richard, you know, you've given us, we just, we're all dying to travel somewhere, you know, we really, really are. But Seamus is bringing us on a gorgeous adventure to Sikkim on um, Friday, aren't you Seamus? Yeah, so we'll, um, it's a the 2015 uh, trip, so of the, the sort of the four recent trips to Sikkim, our May 2015 trip, um, it was April, May, um, taking us from Darjeeling, looking at things like uh, Rodentin Dalhousie, Richard Yu showed the Bar Rabdotum. So looking at everything from sort of uh, Rodentin Dalhousie, then traveling across to Tong Glu, um, Matthew showed uh, slides of it, Marion North's image. Um, so Tong Glu is a mountain that straddles the um, border um, with Darjeeling district at, at Nepal. So looking at things like Rhododendron Griftianum and then traveling up the interior valleys towards the Tibetan border, looking at a sort of spectacular species like Rhododendron Nivium. And actually Richard, Rhododendron Camelliflorum um, <laughs> in its wild native habitat as well. Um, so it's a very gentle talk. It takes in a bit of history, um, but it it is it takes in we were very very lucky because it is a sort of the pre-monsoon season um but it was a bit of the look of the irish we went up the, the Tibetan uh frontier valleys and it, the mountains should have been absolutely uh, hidden in mist but we got very very lucky you know you could very clear, clearly see the mountains in the background it's not just rhododendrons it also is looking at some of the magnolias looking at some of the perennials like cardioprinums trilliums um Biocarpum and, and so on. Um, and some plants that are just so tricky in cultivation that the only place you'll ever see them uh, is in the, in, in the wilds of uh, Skim. So it takes us sort of um, from Matthew's talk, um, looking at these plants in the herbarium, looking at them in the rare book room at Glasnevin through Hooker's publication. So this is seeing the same plants in the flesh, uh, including actually looking at these gorgeous white flowered forms of 
uh, of Rudyard and Falcone, right? So Richard, you stole my thunder a little bit this evening. So um, yeah, so yeah, I'm looking forward to getting that talk tomorrow. But I suppose, James, just one thing about Rhododendron Week, it is, it's all about education and awareness. And I think, Richard, your talk tonight, and Charlotte, you'll probably confirm that this is will be recorded. Yes, And yeah, it, it will, will be, be available, um, because yeah. I just think it was so educational, so informative. And a lot of people will, who weren't able to join us tonight will be able to look back and enjoy your talk again. So thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Right. And uh, or, look yeah. forward to hearing more from you as well. And hopefully we'll see you over here next year for Rhododendron Week, Richard. I'll make a point of coming, don't you worry? Seamus has got a good malt lined up. Well, Richard, actually, when you do come, we grow a lot of your plants. And actually, um, in our chili, chili ravine, every time I pass Blechnum Cycadifolium, I think of you and, and Logan, because it's turning into cracking great plants now at this stage. Yeah, no, it's a great plant, yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's what sort of horticulture is all about. Absolutely. And Nick Jury has the good malt lined up for you, don't worry. Very good. <laughs> yes, a bit of Irish whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have some good tasting. Very good. Great. Richard, thank you very much. Or as we as we say here in Ireland, Gaurav Mila Mahagat. Charlotte, thank you so that. much for everything tonight. No problem. And thank you for bearing with us as we... <laughs> Thanks for all your patience, Charlotte, at the start. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you, Brilliant. Richard. Yeah, you're the one who pulled the show together. So uh, thank you Great. again so, so much. And I hope someday we get to hear more about... You. I'd love to see more of your pictures from Vietnam. So if you're ever doing a talk on your travels uh, in Northern Ireland... Everyone Europe, to talk, just let me know. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Well, uh, we'll wish you all a very good evening and hopefully see you tomorrow night. Certainly see Seamus at least. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> good night, everybody, and thank you. Good thank night you. And thank you. Over and out.